Welcome to Hot Chips 34. Session 3, Academia. Hello, this is um, the next session of Hot Chips 34. This is the academic session, um, and we have uh, four papers uh, to, to, have to talk. The first one is Halo, a flexible and low-power processing fabric for brain-computer brain interfaces. Um, the speakers uh, are Abhishek Abarchi and Ajit Manowar, um, and they will have a recorded in, uh, session and live question and answer. Hello everyone, thank you for watching this talk. My name is Abhishek Bharacharji and I'm on the Yale Computer Science faculty. Um, in this talk, I'll be presenting ongoing work with my colleague Rajat Manohar, who's on the Yale Electrical Engineering faculty. Together with our students, we've been designing, implementing and taping out Halo, which is a sub 15 milliwatt chip for flexible processing of brain signals at data rates of about 50 megabits per second. Um, and Halo is meant for use in implantable brain computer interfaces. So long-term goal of our project is to bring expertise in computer architecture and chip design to enable really high bandwidth communication between the human brain and computer systems. So by high bandwidth, we mean that we want to be able to record from and electrically stimulate large numbers of biological neurons, as large as possible, ideally, um, with sophisticated processing within the loop. So what I mean by this is, for example, consider something like epilepsy and seizures. We'd like to be able to read biological signals from neurons, figure out that a seizure is likely and where it's likely to be, figure this out within milliseconds so that we can then electrically stimulate those regions of the brain and mitigate symptoms of the seizure. Importantly, what we want to do is achieve all of this without exceeding certain power capacities beyond which the BCI itself or the brain computer interface would be viewed as being unsafe for permanent implantation in a human. So I'm gonna show you that it's a hard problem to meet high bandwidth needs while maintaining low power. And I'm gonna show you the steps that we've been taking to address this problem with our graduate students and postdoctoral scholars, all of whom are listed on this slide. By directly reading and electrically stimulating biological neurons, um, brain-computer interfaces of BCIs, they can do a whole range of things. Um, they can restore uh, uh, sensory capabilities. Um, they can mitigate symptoms of epilepsy and Parkinson's disease. They can treat pharmacologically resistant depression and anxiety. They can restore motor capabilities to those afflicted by spinal cord injury, by brain stroke, by ALS, many more conditions. Interestingly, they can also augment cognition in healthy individuals. Um, there's increasing work that's showing that electrically stimulating certain areas of the brain can improve short-term memory in healthy patients. Um, and so that's on the therapeutic side, but in tandem, BCIs are vital to basic neuroscience research because they allow us to, they help us understand the neural circuits um, that work together in concert to promote certain cognition or certain behaviors uh, via controlled experiments that are done in academic settings or, uh, in various labs around the world. Here's a snapshot of some of the um, recent studies of BCIs that have been captured in the popular press. And as you can see, there's a lot of uh, interest ongoing. Uh, and so it should come as no surprise really that at this point, there are several academic and commercial institutions and startups, many of which I'm showing here, that are working on BCIs today. Um, many of these startups are even focused on implantable BCIs specifically. Uh, you may have heard of Neuralink, that's in the popular press quite a bit. In recent uh, months, Synchron or Synchron has been in the popular press uh, as well because uh, it was able to um, use microsurgery to embed a BCI in the motor cortex of a paralyzed patient. So the technique they used was to insert the BCI via the patient's jugular vein, and this allowed them to completely remove the need for open brain surgery. I mean, it was a real uh, leap in uh, making device implantation easier. So in tandem with all of this, the FDA is approving the implantation of brain-computer interfaces for a growing list of neurological illnesses uh, as well. 
Now, I should mention that many important BCIs, not, not all of them are implantable. Many important ones are non-invasive, actually. Um, they realized in the form of headsets um, that are used to collect electrophysiological signals over the skull, through the spinal cord, over muscles, and they can be used to control computers and assistive devices. But what we focus on in this talk is invasive BCIs that are surgically implanted on, around, and in the brain tissue that can record and electrically stimulate as many biological neurons as possible. The reason we do this is that getting implanted uh, devices allows us to collect signals from the brain that are higher in fidelity and in spatial resolution. Both of these things are attractive to clinicians and neuroscience researchers. So having laid out the groundwork for why BCIs uh, are seeing a lot of active work today, let me tell you a little bit about what a typical implantable BCI looks like. Um, so these are devices that are packaged. They package a lot of components together, some of which I'll be talking about shortly. Um, they're packaged together often in these hermetically fused silica capsule or in titanium capsules. And the, one of the most important components of it, obviously, is the sensor. Um, there are many kinds of sensor technologies out there. I'm showing you one example here. This is a, it's, a, it's an electrode grid called a UTA array. Um, there, it's each electrode is able to penetrate a few millimeters of cortical tissue and can read the electrophysiological activity of groups of you know, five to 10 neurons or so. Um, so these sensors are combined with analog to digital converters and, and, and back to you know, digital and to analog conversion as well. And the heart of the BCI is the processing logic. That's the piece that we are focused on. And that's the piece that we've been building Halo for. Now, the other key piece of implantable BCIs is often a wireless radio. These wireless radios exfiltrate data to a computer that may, or a machine that may be sitting uh, you know, in a hospital, something that's outside the patient. There's a lot of ongoing work on how to make these radios as energy efficient as possible for a variety of transmission distances. Um, oftentimes what you see is radios that are in the range of about you know, a few hundred picojoules per bit uh, of energy. Now, Having explained what a BCI looks like, let me tell you what the problem with these BCIs are. And that is that they have uh, requirements that are often in conflict with one another. So on the one hand, what we really want is high bandwidth brain data because that improves the quality of the algorithms that we run. It can improve, for example, the treatment of the patient and so on. The really futuristic goal that DARPA is pushing for is actually data rates of hundreds of megabits per second to tens of gigabits per second. I mean, that those are high data rates. We also oftentimes want that data and we want to process it within tens of milliseconds so that we can take immediate action to do things like treat a seizure if in, an, in a patient that has epilepsy. Now, the problem is how do we do all this while keeping power low enough? And here is the other problem, which is that the FDA warns against having BCIs that dissipate too much power because if they dissipate too much power, they'll overheat the surrounding brain tissue. And overheating surrounding brain tissue beyond a degree Celsius gets risky, you risk damaging the tissue. So this is already all problematic. But then the other sort of aspect of this is that you can't really over-specialize these devices either. What you want is something that's general purpose enough because the neuroscience um, community is exploring a whole range of new computational methods, new use cases, new algorithms. Uh, and we don't want to over-specialize that we can't support these new methods. Additionally, even for the methods we want to support, oftentimes they need to be parameterizable so that you can personalize them to a particular subject or a brain region and so on. And so that's the hard part. How do you meet all of these kind of requirements? And if you actually look at the BCIs that have been built in the last few years in both commercial, um, you know, both in the commercial sector and in the academic sector, they really don't meet all these goals. Um, you know, so if you look at this table at the top, um, this is a visualization of a, of a few BCIs in the last few years that have come out. And as you can see, they tend to support one workload at best rather than a whole bunch that we would like to support in our platform. Things like spike detection and compression and seizure prediction and movement intent and encryption. So that's the first observation. The second observation is that those devices that do meet the 15 milliwatt power budget, they have to give up something else. Either they give up high data rates, which is what the Medtronic devices do, or they'll give up programmability, which is what this other device does. Either way, this is not an ideal situation. And what we want to do with Halo is accommodate a bigger range of workloads while meeting our target safety 
uh, needs in terms of power and supporting high bandwidth communication. And the way we are trying to do this is by designing a modular hardware architecture that is extensible and allows us to support both current and future PCI requirements. Okay, so in trying to design Halo, the first question we have to answer is, well, what kinds of computation are we really gonna support? So to do this, we had to survey a broad range of neuroscientific literature uh, out there. And it's a very complex space. There's many signal processing techniques that are being used as emerging ones coming out. There's a, a, a big uptick in uh, machine learning techniques being used as well. Um, but we were able to identify some important workloads. And crucially, they're representative of both clinical needs and research studies. We wanted that. They also include algorithms that require some real-time performance constraints to be met in some cases. So we wanted that too. And finally, we do try to support both flavors of flexibility that I was discussing before. Um, parameterization of existing algorithms as well as um, support for new, entirely new algorithms as well. So to that end, we support two basic groups of workloads. For miscellaneous algorithms and methods still under development, we implemented a low power embedded microcontroller within Halo. This is similar to what uh, most PCIs actually have today. They either have a microcontroller or some kind of low power FPGA in them today. So to, to suit our needs, we went with a two stage in order 32 bit risk five microcontroller. But additionally, we spent a lot of time building specialized hardware for very important classes of PCI algorithms that we kept seeing, uh, we kept that we found were used over and over again across different uh, um, domains. And so this includes, for example, compression. Here we focused on lossless compression techniques because the question of whether you can afford to lose some data is one that's controversial in the neuroscience community still. We looked at something like movement intent. So here, uh, this is commonly used for patients with essential tremor and Parkinson's. The idea is that you uh, read brain activity from the motor cortex, figure out that something is amiss, and then electrically stimulate the motor cortex or move an assistive device to provide the patient some relief. Seizure treatment is similar. It's a closed loop system again. You try and anticipate the arrival of a seizure and how it's going to spread, and you electrically stimulate the brain to mitigate that. We also looked at spike detection and encryption. Now, for each of those family uh, of, of workloads, there's several actual algorithms that you can use. Uh, not for each, uh, let me take that back, for, for, for some of them. So for example, for compression, you could use LZ4 or LZMA or a discrete wavelet transform-based compression approach. For spike detection, there's a couple of approaches as well. Conventional wisdom dictates that for each of these boxes that I'm showing you, the colored boxes, you would build one ASIC to implement it, right? That would be conventional wisdom. And that's something we're gonna to refer to as monolithic ASIC approach from, from this point on. Now, what I'm gonna show you is that we can actually do better. Um, instead of building a monolithic ASIC for every one of these boxes, we'll replace them with smaller ASICs that can be uh, sort of pipelined in programmable ways. Uh, and that allows us to achieve better power in some cases, that is what allows us to actually achieve power that's under that 15 milliwatt cap for the whole BCI. I should also mention that the assumption is that at any given point in time, a doctor, a technician, or a clinician will program the Halo device to support one of these algorithms, but not all at the same time. So that's an important assumption as I show you how we build our hardware. So in order to show you what we do, let's contrast the monolithic ASIC approach for the LZ4 compression scheme that we want to support. Now, you could build LZ4 in one hardware block, but our insight is that if you inspect LZ4's computation carefully, you will see that there are really two separate kernels of computation going on within. One of them is a lempel ziv match offset pair search, and that's the LZ kernel, and the other is a linear integer coding or LIC kernel. But we noticed that because of the nature of the computation within these two distinct kernels, they could actually be run at different operating frequencies while sustaining the overall data rate that we were targeting with our BCI, which was that 50 megabit per second number that I mentioned before. And so what that allowed us to do actually is go from a monolithic ASIC that had to be clocked at 233 megahertz to an LZ and LIC processing element of PE in Halo parlance that requires much less operating, uh, a far smaller operating frequency, lower operating frequency. In terms of power, this translates to roughly a five uh, factor of five in terms of power savings. 
Um, so it's it's really quite substantial. Um, and so just to sort of emphasize the point, we're replacing a monolithic ASIC with what we call processing elements, each of which operates in its own clock domain. Now, the next thing that we started doing is we said, well, actually, there's also opportunities to reuse some of these PEs for other uh, processing pipelines. So instead of LZ4, let's take the LZMA compression pipeline. Here, if you inspect this, you can see that the LZ is needed as well, but there's also a separate kernel called an MA, and we can realize a separate processing element for MA instead. And what we now need to do is to place a programmable switch between the LZ and the LIC and MA module so that a clinician, doctor, or technician can program that to route the output of LZ appropriately. If you look at this some more, we can actually turn out to even better. The MA block can be replaced with an MA and a range coding uh, module. And that allows us to clock each of those at a lower clock speed than MA. And what it permits is overall power savings of a factor of three because of the reduced clock speeds on all of these modules. Moving on, we can see the same general principles can be applied to yet another well-known lossless compression algorithm based on discrete wavelets. Here, we were able to substitute a monolithic ASIC with three hardware PEs, uh, one of which does the discrete wavelet transform, and two of which are already, already um, actually implemented uh, in Halo, the MA and the RC modules uh, as well. So we get to recycle those. Similarly, for spike detection, we, took, uh, we looked at, first of all, the near energy operator and threshold based way of doing this, and we split that up into a near energy operator or near module and a separate thresholder. And this allowed us to run them at different frequencies. It also allowed us actually to use the thresholder for the other kind of spike detection approach, which is based on discrete wavelet transforms. In fact, for this approach, we didn't even need to create a separate DWD module either. We could reuse the one that was placed for compression. Now let's take movement intent, the other algorithm we want to support. Turns out that movement intent also needs a thresholder, but it additionally needs something like an FFT module as well. So we had to build that. But that FFT module, as it turns out, was useful also for seizure treatment pipelines. Seizure treatment pipelines make use of FFT, cross-core, and band uh, Butterworth bandpass filtering, as well as a support vector machine where the outputs of those modules are piped. And so again, you can see this business of reusing certain PEs, which allows us to be thrifty with transistor count, with hardware, and to save power um, as well. Now, as we're sharing these PEs, we obviously need to maintain some degree of parameterization in there because different pipelines need different parameterizations to different patients, different brain targets. So that is permitted, but um, that's not particularly difficult to support um, in our hardware. And finally, um, in the 28 nanometer uh, CMOS process uh, in which we did our physical synthesis flow uh, to do our initial design, these were the um, frequencies and power numbers that we saw. As you can see, big power savings across the board by basically clocking each of these PEs in its own domain and replacing monolithic ASICs, which all pretty much need higher frequencies with this approach. So with that, I'm now going to hand off the reins to, uh, to Rajit, who's going to take you through the remainder uh, of the slides. Thank you. Thanks, Abhishek. We, we were planning on tipping out to 20 a nanometer, but we actually got uh, access to a 12 nanometer technology, so we quickly pivoted. The following slide shows the, the part of the design that we actually taped out, which was most of it, actually, and we just didn't do uh, some of the processing elements. If you, you looked at the numbers carefully, you will you might notice that actually the frequency of some of these components is actually higher than what it was in uh, 28 nanometer, even though we went to a, a better fabrication technology, and I will explain why that is the case. Processing elements are supposed to be designed to support all the computation that's needed by neuroscience researchers, but this is actually a moving target. And because it's a moving target, we wanted to develop a design methodology for Halo where we use an agile development flow. And as it was to do to support this, we decided to use a, a high level synthesis flow for processing element design. We standardized the way a high level HLS module is written uh, for, our, for our chip with standard input and output ports, as well as a standard configuration port. 
all inputs and outputs have to support an elastic I/O interface, which means that the processing element has to be able to absorb stores on its inputs or its outputs and, and absorb arbitrary data or arrival rates. We'd applied a number of optimizations in translating every processing element into uh, Halo hardware by you know usual the usual list of things, including using fixed point support where, where instead of floating point where possible, changing loops architectures and loop structures and uh, and selecting parameters for loop pipelining and loop unrolling. Now each processing element runs in its own clock domain. For this prototype, the interconnect is also clocked and it runs at a different frequency. Uh, eventually, we plan to do, replace this interconnect with an asynchronous one for, for both power and performance reasons. But our current implementation has the interconnect as clocked. And so for all the inputs and outputs of every processing element, we have to develop uh, clock domain converters. Um, so we insert clock domain converters between unrelated clock domain crossings for both the inputs and outputs of every processing element. In addition, these clock domain uh, converters also include a FIFO. Um, and I will describe that in a little more detail. Now, a key aspect of the, the Halo architecture is that we run each PE at, a, at its own frequency, the minimum frequency at which it can support the average data rate of the data streams flowing through the processing unit. However, the free, because some of the processing elements have complex state machines internally, they actually run at a higher frequency than the data rate that they support. What this means is that each Processing element has a peak data input and out data generation and a data consumption rate that's determined by its local frequency. And this is actually higher than the steady state average throughput that they support. Uh, there's a mismatch between the output token generation rate and the input token consumption rate. And you need FIFOs to absorb this difference. Otherwise, uh, you'll stall the processing element and then you may not actually be able to meet the total throughput requirement of the overall system. Now, if, if you just did this naively, you would end up with very large FIFOs. And these large FIFOs would actually end up dominating the power budget of our chip. So instead, what we do is we try to streamline, the, minimize the a number of FIFOs that we need. And in some cases, we actually clock the processing element at a higher frequency than needed to support the worst case data access patterns. Uh, and the reason we do that is to reduce the input FIFO size. And that's actually why in the 12 nanometer prototype, which includes all the FIFOs that we need, we, we clock some of the uh, PEs at a higher rate than you might think is necessary to support throughput. Finally, every element of the architecture exports a standardized config port. I mentioned this before, but one of the interesting things about this config port is not only does it support parameter settings for each component, but it also supports reading status registers from each component. And we can use this for, say, debug support to see if, a, if the PE, is, PE state is healthy, for example. There's a corresponding config module that we augmented the risk five core with that's under software control, so you can use software to interrogate the state of all the processing elements. To evaluate our architecture and to, to get power numbers uh, through activity factors and so on and so forth, we, we wanted to use real data, real uh, data from brain recordings. Um, so we, we've used uh, recordings from non-human primates collected by a neuroscience lab in Brown. And more recently, from we, collect, we have recordings from the Yale Epilepsy Research Center from human patients. And we use this to evaluate our architecture. What I'm going to show you is just what, sort of the, the evaluation, detailed evaluation results that we collected in 28 nanometer for a range of different uh, algorithms running on Halo from spike detection, various compression algorithms, movement detect, intense seizure prediction, and just raw encryption. And we looked at three different scenarios. One of them is running them all in software and adding as many cores that we needed to support the throughput requirements. And you can see that just using lots of cores isn't sufficient to meet the power constraints. When we, when we, when we meet the throughput requirements, we don't meet the power constraints. Now, most of the power constraints can, the power constraints for most of these algorithms can be met with a monolithic ASIC, which is shown in green. But in, but in spite of that, in, in at least in compression, which is actually a pretty common use case, uh, the monolithic ASIC does not meet the 15 milliwatt power constraint. But Halo can, can actually successfully meet this power constraint across a range of, for all our benchmarks. And this is because we clock each component of the algorithm at a lower frequency than you might need when you take the composition uh, with a monolithic ASIC. 
To summarize, we've developed this flexible brain computer interface architecture, which is modular and extensible, so we can add new components as new algorithms are becoming important for the BCI space. Here is our current team that's working on this project. Pro project. This is an active project. We plan more future uh, tape outs with you know, more features, more functionality, including more general you know, vector processing, um, storage support, and distributed BCI scenarios. We are also uh, exploring the possibility of implanting our chips in both uh, animals as well as over, you know, later on and eventually in human studies. Um, our team consists of a number of graduate students uh, and undergraduate students at Yale, as well as our collaborators and from computer science, Professor Anurag Khandelwal, and uh, our collaborators from Yale Medical, Medical School, uh, Hitin Saveri and Dr. Dennis Spencer. With that, we, uh, uh, we'd like to conclude our talk and be happy to take any questions. Well, I uh, neglected to mention that Abhishek is an associate professor of computer science at Yale and Rajit is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at Yale. Um, <clears throat> now, you're testing these devices on recordings from previous interfaces, um, so you don't necessarily need to try these out right away in, in uh, real, um, uh, real live subjects, but do you have a notion about how that might be done? <clears throat> Does that influence your architecture in terms of how you might um, uh, use uh, live subjects, uh, whether human or not? Yeah, so thanks for the question, Forrest. Um, so this uh, architecture was designed actually to work in the loop. So the idea is that a lot of the constraints that we were targeting, the power constraint, the real-time latency constraint, that's influenced by actually the need to, uh, the, the desire to actually have this work in vivo. So one constraint I didn't get a chance to speak of um, too concretely in the talk was um, about certain, um, some of the algorithms like the seizure prediction pipelines and the movement intent pipelines. Those have been designed to operate within 10 millisecond loops um, so that we can get the data, process it and electrically stimulate the brain within about 10 milliseconds of say detecting a seizure. Um, I'm not sure that that quite answers the question you may have asked, does it get to what you were going for? Well, I understand the power constraints. You don't want to fry anything. Um, and what you're saying is uh, uh, another big constraint is the uh, response time. That's right. Yes. Right. For That's many of the um, for many of the emerging use cases for BCIs, there's a big emphasis on generally millisecond response times between right. some aberrant behavior and either actuating some prostheses or electrically stimulating the brain. So how long do these kinds of implants last? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so the longest known, um, so let me see how, how to best answer this. So in, in, in terms of real patients with FDA approved implants, the longest known uh, implant lifetime has been the order of about, I think, eight years at this point. Um, there's been simulation results that, you know, and studies from mostly the packaging and the sensor vendors that try to prorate how long the lifetimes of these implants would be, because those are usually the pieces of the entire package that most influence whether these systems are getting damaged or not. Um, many of those studies suggest that these things should be operational for about 20 to 30 years, but oftentimes in practice, what happens is that scar tissue develops around the actual sensors. And so one of the sort of important considerations, which is outside of the chip design and architecture side of things, is really of getting the sensors right in order to reduce, uh, to, to increase lifetime. So one of the questions uh, asked about the moral implications, I, I assume that might mean, uh, do you think about encryption and decryption when you're uh, uh, dealing with these kinds of, pro this kind of processing? Yeah, so I think there's several layers to that question, and that's a great question, and, and you know, I want to thank, uh, I think it was, uh, let's see, Andre for asking it. Um, so there's many levels to unpack here. Um, I think one of the things to consider in the BCI space is that um, oftentimes, you know, we're balancing all of these different constraints that, that have a tension between them, right? I mean, you want something extremely power efficient on the one hand, but on the other hand, if you're going to surgically embed one of these devices in a, in a patient, 
it is, I think, a moral obligation that we can do more with this device than just one thing. So that's kind of one aspect of it. Um, encryption, decryption is another important one. Uh, most of the commercial BCIs that are in use today don't really have the support for basic encryption is, is not really that well known. So one of the things we did in our design was to make sure we had that AES block to try to mitigate some of this. But, you know, I think looking beyond, there's a bigger question of the fact that we're collect collecting all of these data sets. And, you know, there's a question of, you know, when you get access to neural processes, you know, their underlying conscious thought, right? And so uh, there's an access to a level of self that maybe cannot be consciously filtered by a subject that has one of these things. and something that I think is gonna become an increasing concern for architects and chip designers going ahead is interfacing with legal scholars on this work. So for example, um, right now I would, I would point people to um, uh, the Council of Europe has a resolution that they adopted in 2020, which is specifically calls on member states to develop legal frameworks to manage all of this neural data and to have adequate legal oversight of BCI technologies. Um, Chile, uh, another place that is looking into this is Chile, which is developing sort of a, um, laws on what BCIs would mean to, um, well, to the legal system because BCIs can potentially break this idea of mensa re, which is uh, this idea that, you know, the act, the conscious act of committing a crime is what implicates, you know, what does this mean for BCIs is an open question. Where we come in as chip designers and computer architects, I think is an open question. I think the encryption, decryption, aspects of things naturally. But I think if you'd say, take this device, um, some immediate things we have to worry about, I would say, are the formal methods implications of these kinds of things. Can we build the hardware with, you know, specs and guarantees that we're meeting the specs from the ground up? Um, there's the implementation of known techniques like memory protection and such, which we may have to revisit in this context once we start running multiple processes on them. But yeah, I mean, that's sort of a a rough answer to that. I mean, it's a broad question. So it certainly yeah. is. Well, I think we're out of time. Um, I think you you have uh, promised to continue to monitor the Slack channel and potentially answer questions in more detail there. So uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. So our second talk is uh, Kraken, a uh, direct event frame-based multi-sensor fusion SOC for ultra-efficient visual processing in nano UAVs. Um, and the presenter is um, Alfio Di Mori at uh, ETH in Zurich. Um, he is um, <clears throat> in the department of uh, uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, electronic engineering, and um, we'll uh, present a, a, um, a live talk as well as a live question and answer. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Alfio Di Mauro. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at ETH Zurich. Uh, thank you, Forrest, for the, for the introduction. In this talk, I will be uh, presenting Kraken, a direct event frame-based multi-sensor fusion system on chip for ultra-efficient visual processing in nano uh, UAPs. Uh, we know that drones are nowadays assisting uh, many activities of, of humans. Uh, at last year, Hot Chips, Abram Bakrak from Skydio presented this very uh, interesting advanced autonomous drone capable of performing 3D mapping and motion planning, as well as object recognition and obstacle avoidance. And all those applications, they were uh, deployed on a single drone platform of roughly 800 grams of weight and with a battery capacity of uh, slightly more than 5,000 uh, milliamp per hour. Those type of platforms becomes very uh, useful when uh, we want to execute uh, applications like search and rescue, uh, post-disaster inspection, as well as surveillance or, for example, uh, critical infrastructure uh, maintenance. Uh, the question we asked ourselves at ETH was, uh, can we deploy uh, these applications in much tighter uh, space constraints? The answer is likely uh, yes. Uh, nowadays, we have this uh, very interesting type of drone platforms uh, called non-drones, like the Crazy Fly produced by Bitcraze, which comes in a much smaller form factor, 
And with uh, the smaller form factor, we have, of course, uh, several implications, like the much smaller payload of those platforms, roughly 30 times lighter. And uh, of course, also a smaller battery capacity that is uh, roughly 20x smaller than what we have in bigger drone platforms. So the real challenge uh, when it comes to deploying the application to those platforms is, uh, can we fit sufficient intelligence into a 30x smaller payload and 20x uh, lower energy budget? Deploying, uh, let's say, visual application and achieving true autonomy on these nano UAVs means essentially executing complex visual tasks at high speed and robustness and fully on board, more, uh, more specifically. Uh, when I say visual task, I'm specifically referring to, uh, for example, obstacle avoidance and navigation, as well as uh, environment exploration, uh, where the drone uh, has to navigate and build a map of the environment, for example. And while doing this operation, uh, possibly we also want to uh, execute object detection and classification. For this reason, at ETH, we uh, decided to address all these visual tasks by designing a dedicated SOC that we named after the mythological creature, uh, the Kraken. Uh, what you see here is the very high level uh, architecture of the Kraken SOC that is mainly composed of four different parts. We have a so-called IO peripheral subsystem that hosts all the dedicated hardware interface to interact with sensors and actuators. The subsystem is connected to uh, what we call a fabric controller, which is essentially a microcontroller subsystem that is built around RISC-V core, equipped with a one megabyte of memory and several other peripherals like interrupt controllers, timers, or clock generators. And then we have two uh, accelerator subsystem. Uh, general purpose one, that is called a uh, RISC-V based compute, uh, compute cluster, which is formed essentially uh, of uh, eight uh, RISC-V uh, cores uh, announced with dedicated ISA extensions, uh, as well as floating point uh, hardware support. And then we have another system that internally is composed of two additional uh, accelerators, uh, an aeromorphic accelerator called SME to uh, execute inference uh, of spiking neural networks, and an extremely uh, quantized, uh, energy-efficient uh, ternary weight network accelerator uh, called QT. To give you, uh, uh, let's say, a, a better idea of what are the autonomous navigation building blocks that we uh, could deploy on systems like Kraken, I would like to uh, show you uh, the following, uh, let's say, picture overview of, of, of our system. Uh, the idea is to use the fabric controller, essentially, to collect data from sensors. Uh, for example, imagers. Then uh, we can deploy, for example, uh, neural networks like Dronet presented by Palos in 2019 uh, to perform obstacle avoidance on board. And this we can deploy it on the RISC-V uh, based cluster. Uh, on the neuromorphic accelerator, uh, we want to deploy some algorithm that is, uh, let's say, fast reacting, for example, to a uh, rapid uh, change in the scene where our drone is navigating. And for this reason, we could deploy networks like Leaf FireNet, presented by Hagenars in 2021, which is essentially a low latency optical flow spiking neural networks. And eventually, we uh, can also deploy, for example, accurate object recognition uh, performed with a ternary weight network on the uh, ternary uh, weight network accelerator uh, called QT. The first aspect that I would like to describe uh, about Kraken uh, is how we can uh, actually collect data from various sensors. And uh, in our view, uh, an interesting aspect of this architecture is uh, the fact that we can build a so-called multi-sensor direct data flow uh, stream of data uh, towards the accelerator. So, if you look at uh, the block diagram uh, here, this is representing uh, our high system. So we have pads on, well, on our side, uh, on one side, and peripherals on, on the other side. Those peripherals are attached to uh, a so-called autonomous IO subsystem that internally we call uh, microDMA, because exactly like a DMA engine is capable of transferring data from sensors, either to the L2 memory or to uh, a dedicated accelerator that we will see later. Uh, in this IO subsystem, we support uh, many protocols, uh, so from the very standard ones like uh, I2C, Quotas SPI, or UART, uh, but we also support like, a bit more advanced protocols like Hyperbus to interact, for example, with external L3 memories. And of course, as we are targeting visual application, uh, we support uh, even cameras. We will see later uh, what they are, and more conventional RGB frame-based cameras through dedicated hardware interface. Uh, 
So when it comes to uh, collecting data from the outside world to uh, send it, for example, to an accelerator or to the main memory, it is sufficient to program uh, the respective uh, peripheral, like dedicated hardware peripheral, and the autonomous IO subsystem, and directly stream data from one sensor to the desired target. We can do this for uh, event frame uh, coming from event cameras, as well as from RGB frames and many other data coming from other peripherals. So after we have seen how we can collect data from, from sensors, what I would like to show uh, in this part of the presentation is how we actually process data in Kraken. The first uh, accelerator that we will describe is the neuromorphic accelerator. But uh, before entering into uh, more details about this accelerator, let me spend a few words on uh, what is a, an event camera and what is an event frame. Event cameras are essentially uh, a special type of imagers that, uh, as opposed to uh, conventional cameras that provide the absolute uh, brightness on each pixel, they actually provide the derivative of the brightness on each pixel in an asynchronous way. So what you see represented here as blue and red pixels uh, simply corresponds to uh, the brightness exceeding a positive threshold, so a positive event, or the brightness exceeding uh, a negative threshold uh, or a negative event. So they are represented respectively as uh, positive events as red pixels and blue uh, events, uh, uh, say as, as let's say sorry, blue pixel as negative events. If we slice, uh, for example, uh, a smaller patch of this um, stream of event frames. Uh, we find a situation like the one you see represented here. So it's essentially a sparse uh, tensor of events distributed over time, so positive and negative. So this is the type of data that ideally we want to feed into the neuromorphic uh, accelerator in Kraken. The neuromorphic accelerator is composed of uh, basic processing elements that are essentially divided into different parts. Uh, one side of the processing elements is in charge of implementing a so-called synaptic connection. So like any other uh, DNN accelerator, this is simply implementing, for example, a convolutional filter or a linear filter. The other part of the processing elements is practically implementing the dynamic of the artificial neuron uh, of our accelerator. For those uh, who are uh, not really familiar with uh, neuromorphic uh, computing, in, in Kraken, in SNE, uh, we are implementing a so-called leaky integrated fire uh, neuron, which is a very popular uh, type of uh, digital uh, neuromorphic uh, neuron. As opposed to artificial uh, neuron that we find in uh, conventional DNNs, uh, leaky integrated fire neurons uh, present uh, an additional uh, state variable that is called membrane potential that actually evolves over time as uh, you know, we receive uh, events in our processing elements. So this processing element is practically performing two types of operations, so-called synaptic accumulation, that is an operation that happens whenever we have an event that gets filtered, and then uh, the contribution is accumulated on this uh, variable state, and then uh, whenever we have a certain number of time steps where no events are present at the input of our neuron, we uh, let this uh, membrane potential decay with an exponential trend. And in this, in this occasion, the accelerator performs a so-called synaptic decay, as you see represented here. Then, uh, whenever there is an event that is capable of bringing this membrane potential above a certain threshold that is programmable, uh, the neuron, or the processing element in this case, uh, outputs uh, an event uh, that is uh, of the same type of the one that we find in the input of this uh, of this neuron. So the mechanic is is rather simple. Uh, this brings me to the let's say uh, next slide, which is uh, actually showing how uh, we can deploy complete networks on the spiking neural networks and what is the complete architecture of this accelerator. SNE, so the spiking neural engine, is composed of three different types of blocks. Uh, a data streamer that is essentially in charge of uh, collecting data either from a sensor or from, from the main memory. A synaptic crossbar that acts as a router uh, redirecting events from the data streamer, for example, to uh, one engine. And then practically the engine that performs the computation. We have eight of these uh, objects inside uh, SNE uh, architecture. And each one is composed by 16 of the processing elements that I've been describing in the previous slide. And each processing element, it's implementing 
64 leaky integrated fire neuron in a time domain multiplex uh, way. Uh, to minimize the traffic towards the memory, all the state variables are held uh, locally uh, to the processing elements. And moreover, inside the uh, each engine, we also have dedicated memory to host uh, the weights and also minimize the traffic uh, towards the memory. Uh, SNE is a so-called uh, output stationary type of accelerator. That means that whenever we want to deploy, uh, for example, a layer on, on a certain number of engines, we simply have to statically map the output neuron on the available uh, processing elements. So in the case of processing uh, events coming from an event camera, it is sufficient to divide the input frame in multiple patches and then redirect the events belonging to each patch to uh, the respective uh, engine where the layer is mapped inside the accelerator. Uh, SNE is a data flow architecture. That means that the events that are produced by one layer, for example, they can be simply redirected to uh, another layer that is mapped on other engines. And we can continue this process. Uh, for example, in this case, we are simulating mapping a small neural network on all the engines. And finally, we can get a prediction output uh, let's say on the output of the of the accelerator. SNE can perform uh, roughly uh, 500 synaptic decay and 24 synaptic accumulation per cycle. So it's a fairly high throughput accelerator to be a, a digital neuromorphic accelerator. The second engine that we uh, have in Kraken, it's called QT. It's a ternary weight network accelerator, so very low precision uh, type of neural networks. It's supposed to operate in conjunction with frame coming from uh, conventional RGB cameras. And also in this case, uh, this accelerator is composed by, uh, let's say, multiple uh, so-called output channel compute units that are the basic computational elements inside the accelerator. Uh, it's a ternary weight accelerator. That means that uh, if we take uh, inputs from, from an RGB frame, first of all, we have to ternarize this, um, this data. And then uh, we can simply unroll and linearize this uh, patch that you see represented here, for example, and slightly uh, slide it inside the accelerator cycle by cycle. Also in this case, to minimize the traffic uh, towards the memory, we uh, have dedicated memory inside these OCU units to store all the weights. And the computation in this case is performed in a completely unrolled way, especially for the inner products. And the result of the inner product is then uh, fed into a systolic uh, multiplying accumulation unit. So this architecture uh, allows to uh, basically uh, compute one output activation per cycle on each OCU unit. What I'm showing here is the complete uh, architecture of the, of the QT uh, implementation we have in Kraken. Uh, as you might know, uh, ternary uh, values can be represented with slightly less than two bits. Uh, so in memory, we actually uh, use uh, a compressed format uh, occupying only 1.6 uh, bits per value. And then we have a mechanism to compress and decompress on the fly uh, those data once we feed it into the accelerator. Uh, Kraken's configuration has 96 OCU units, each one uh, performing three by three convolutions. We have dedicated uh, storage space inside the accelerator to host 64 by 64 uh, pixel feature maps and also to host nine layer of, of weights. Uh, if we do the math with 96 uh, OCU units, basically we can perform roughly uh, slightly more than 80,000 ternary uh, mark per cycle. So also in this case, we have a very high throughput uh, accelerator. This essentially concludes the first part of the presentation, where we have uh, looked more at the architecture of the different uh, computing engine we have in Kraken, and brings me directly to the silicon prototype. Uh, this is the chip that has been actually manufactured in uh, Global Foundry's 22 nanometers FDX technology. It's a nine square millimeter uh, chip. Uh, here you see overlaid uh, all the basic blocks, uh, computing uh, subsystems that I've been describing. So the fabric controller, the microcontroller subsystem, uh, the RISC-V cluster, the neuromorphic accelerator, and the ternary weight network uh, accelerator. The chip is meant to operate on a fairly uh, wide uh, voltage operating range. So from 0.5 volts to 0.9 uh, volts. On the cluster, we reach uh, 370 megahertz. 
On QT and SNE, respectively, uh, we can reach 140 and 220 uh, megahertz uh, at, the, at the highest voltage, of course. Uh, as we don't know uh, a priori what is the, the final application uh, for, for this chip, as we might employ it in, in several contexts, we implemented also some uh, low power feature like uh, clock and power gating on each uh, individual uh, subsystem. Now we move to the uh, result and benchmarking uh, let's say related to all the individual subsystems. Uh, the first um, subsystem that I'm presenting here is the RISC-V based cluster. So we are showing here the power and performance trade-off. Uh, when the system is executing a parallel convolutional benchmark parallelized on eight cores. Uh, in the plot here, we see represented the uh, energy efficiency in giga operations per second per watt. Uh, those data are plotted on a logarithmic scale, uh, and they are plotted against the performance of the chip uh, in terms of uh, DOPS per second, also on a logarithmic scale. So as you can imagine, the higher, the better on, on both uh, axes, of course. I was mentioning in the introduction that this subsystem, or the cores uh, of this subsystem, are equipped with dedicated uh, SIMD uh, operations, ISA extensions. And um, this is specifically to maximize the power and the performance. And uh, thanks to these extensions, uh, each core can operate on a wide range of numerical precisions. So from 32 bits to two bits, basically. Uh, when executing instructions at 32 bits, uh, we reach a peak throughput of roughly one Mach per cycle uh, per core. As the system can uh, work in, uh, let's say, various operating voltages, uh, we, um, we can run uh, applications in two different energy modes. Uh, one that we call high throughput mode, where we reach 90 gops per second at the highest voltage and highest frequency, of course. And then a high energy efficiency mode that is, uh, let's say, reached at um, 0.5 volt and the maximum frequency that we can reach at this voltage, where we achieve 1.9 terops per second per watt. To put those results in, in perspective, uh, we uh, projected the performance of, uh, of this uh, RISC-V-based uh, cluster when it's executing uh, neural networks like DroneNet and performing obstacle avoidance. And we found out that we, we can actually run inference performing this task at uh, roughly 28 inference per second. The second subsystem that we are benchmarking here is the neuromorphic accelerator. Uh, this subsystem has been uh, characterized uh, when executing a sample five-layer uh, SNN, uh, and the SNN is parallelized on all eight SNE uh, engines. Here we see uh, plotted two uh, different uh, metrics, so the inference per second, also on a logarithmic scale, and the inference energy, also in this case on a logarithmic scale. Uh, both quantities are plotted versus the uh, network activity. Uh, we will see why uh, later this is actually an important uh, parameter for the neuromorphic accelerator. As for the previous subsystem, uh, we can also uh, say execute uh, this accelerator or operate this accelerator in two energy modes. High throughput one, uh, where we reach uh, 55 gigasynaptic operations per second at the highest voltage and the high energy efficiency mode where we reach 1.1 terasynaptic operations per second per watt. Uh, as you can see from the plot, uh, there is an interesting aspect here, that is the fact that uh, both metrics are improving with the sparsity of the network. And this is due to the fact that uh, SNE has been designed to be uh, inherently energy proportional. This means that the more events, for example, coming from an event camera, uh, we need to process, uh, the higher is the energy that we spend uh, processing these, uh, these events. And of course, uh, as a consequence, the higher is the latency. This is a very interesting feature because it means that whenever the activity of the network is very low, uh, if we project this performance in a real uh, use case, for example, the leaf fire net uh, to perform optical flow that I was mentioning in the introduction, uh, when the activity is very low, we can run uh, inference at roughly 20 kilo inference per second, consuming very little energy. And okay, as a consequence, when the activity increases, uh, we run, uh, let's say, slightly uh, le uh, let's say, a little bit less inference, uh, so roughly one kilo inference per second, 170 microjoule per inference. 
The last system that I'm showing here, it's uh, Qt. Also in this case, we are showing power and performance trade-off uh, when the system is uh, executing neural network uh, inference. In this case, uh, we see the energy efficiency in terops per second per watt uh, versus the voltage on one axis. And on the other axis, we uh, see the performance of this accelerator in uh, measured in terops per second. Uh, as for the previous subsystems, we also have this high throughput mode where we reach 55 terops per second and the high energy efficiency mode where we exceed actually one uh, petaop per second per watt on ternary waste networks. Uh, projecting those results on a real use case, uh, we can perform uh, object detection with this uh, subsystem uh, with an accuracy of 86% and an energy of 2.7 microjoule per uh, inference. So this brings me to the let's say, final comparison with the state of the art, uh, where we um, actually advanced the state of the art on all the tasks. So for what concerns the RISC-V cluster, uh, we compared the performance of Kraken uh, against uh, the performance reported by other uh, state of the art uh, pulp chips like uh, Vega presented by uh, Rossi in uh, 2022. Uh, for 32 uh, bit to 8 bit uh, instructions, we achieved comparable energy efficiency. And actually, for very low precision CMD operations, we achieved the highest energy uh, efficiency. Benchmarking the neuromorphic accelerator, we improved the state of the art by 1.7x uh, compared to design presented by uh, them in 2020. And on ternary weight networks uh, with QT, so on low precision networks, we improved the state of the art by uh, 2x, uh, again, let's say compared to the design uh, presented by Moons in 2018. So this actually uh, brings me uh, to the conclusion of this presentation. Uh, what you see here is a, is a picture of the chip and a picture of the evolution board that we have designed. Uh, in conclusion, Kraken can solve three complex visual tasks, practically enabling autonomous navigation on, on nano uh, UAVs. Uh, specifically, we achieve uh, this goal by, for example, running optical flow on the neuromorphic accelerators from uh, data coming from even cameras, uh, obstacle avoidance uh, on RGB uh, frames on a general purpose risk five based cluster, and object detection uh, always from RGB frames on a ternary weight network uh, low precision uh, accelerator. Uh, Moreover, I didn't have time to mention it in the, in the presentation. We uh, already developed a vertical uh, software stack to deploy a complete application on, on this chip. And as you can imagine, uh, in terms of uh, next step, the idea is to uh, shrink uh, the PCP you see here on a nano drone form factor and practically uh, deploy it on a, on a crazy fly uh, drone. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, in this design, uh, I can mention that they are uh, available uh, as open source design. So both the neuromorphic uh, and the ternary weight network accelerator, uh, like um, also all the other uh, part of the system. So the PAL project is an open source project. And the content of this presentation will be uh, released as uh, open access uh, at the following week. So this actually concludes uh, my presentation. I would like to thank the audience uh, for uh, listening to me. and. I, now uh, ready for your questions. Well, Alfio, thank you very much. That was an interesting presentation. Um, your title says uh, multi-sensor fusion. Um, it appears that you're mainly looking at RGB frames, uh, i.e. one kind of sensor. Is that, am I getting that correct? Uh, well, actually, uh, the idea, uh, okay, in this scenario that we are presenting, uh, we have um, actually used a different subsystem for a different uh, type of data. But of course, this is a very preliminary uh, stage of uh, deploying uh, application okay. on this platform. Uh, in principle, we also have uh, part of the system that, for example, allows to uh, fuse uh, RGB frames with uh, even frames coming uh, from, the, from the event camera and for example, run classification on those data with the ternary weight network accelerator. Got it. Uh, on, a, uh, let's say on a different note, I can mention also that uh, neuromorphic accelerator and spiking neural network uh, specifically are often used to perform sensor fusions. So uh, again, here I didn't have time to enter into more details, but for example, uh, 
Another idea would be to um, interface other sensors, like uh, line of sight or other sensors that can assist uh, autonomous navigation and fuse uh, data coming from this sensor on the neuromorphic accelerator. Sure. With the spiking so what, what is the resolution of your input Im images is one of the questions we have. Uh, yes, for what concerns the event camera, it's um, the system is designed to um, to work with a fairly, uh, let's say, low resolution cameras, so 128 by 104, if I remember correctly. So, but uh, let's say on on that uh, on that order of magnitude. And for RGB frames, uh, I think we can support up to uh, QVGA uh, resolution. And and how many frames per second can you process with those resolutions? Uh, the well, uh, for example, if we consider processing those frames on the, let's say on the general purpose cluster, uh, of course, as uh, being a general purpose uh, computing engine, this is uh, slightly slower than dedicated accelerator, but still uh, we can achieve uh, roughly uh, 25 to 28 uh, frame per seconds when running those frames uh, through a neural network. Sure. And did you add any additional instructions to your uh, CPU cores, RISC uh, five? Uh, yes. I mean, not specifically uh, for uh, this task. Uh, in general, uh, the cores that we have in um, in, in Kraken, uh, they are uh, well equipped with a dedicated set of uh, ISA extensions. Uh, one that I mentioned in the presentation was the CIMD uh, extension supporting low precisions. But we also have other dedicated extensions like uh, Mac and Load or other uh, type of uh, extensions that can improve performance on general purpose computation. Well, this is a, a great example of, um, of, of processing for drones, uh, lower weight, lower power, um, and, uh, and acceleration. It's really terrific. Um, I assume you're going to be around and monitoring the Slack channel for further questions and, and answers. Sure, sure. Yes. Uh, that'll be great. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Our, our third talk is Amber, a uh, close-grained reconfigurable array processed SOC for dense linear algebra acceleration. Um, <clears throat> There's a, a very long list of authors, uh, and the presenter is, uh, where is, uh, Kathleen Fung, and these are uh, all from um, uh, Stanford. So, uh, Kathleen, are you ready to start? Hi, everyone. I am Kathleen Fang, a PhD student at Stanford University, advised by Priyanka Reyna. I will be presenting on AMBER, a coarse-grained, reconfigurable array-based SOC targeted for dense linear algebra applications, including image processing, computer vision, and machine learning. Dedicated hardware accelerators have become popular for dense linear algebra applications because of their very high performance and energy efficiency. However, applications change and evolve. In this image classification task, for example, the highest accuracy network is constantly changing. Dedicated accelerators optimized for the previous state-of-the-art become obsolete and must be redesigned, which takes a long time and significant design effort. Reconfigurable accelerators, on the other hand, offer the flexibility needed to quickly adapt to rapidly changing applications. Reconfigurability usually comes at a price. First, the process of reconfiguring the hardware to run a specific application often takes a long time leaving hardware resources idle instead of doing useful work. Secondly, memory control logic is often implemented in the reconfigurable fabric itself, making it inefficient relative to specialized memory control logic. But at the same time, dedicated hardware to perform specific operations often goes underutilized or even completely unutilized for applications that don't need those operations. We want a reconfigurable accelerator with a fast reconfiguration time and efficient memory control logic and compute units that support all necessary operations, even if they're rarely used. The design of AMBER, our SOC, addresses these common shortcomings of reconfigurable accelerators. First, I'll go over the architecture of AMBER. 
At the heart of Amber is a coarse-grained reconfigurable array, or CGRA. It is a grid of tiles connected to each other through a reconfigurable interconnect. The CGRA has two tile types. The processing element, or PE, performs a variety of int16 and bfloat16 operations. It also has a register file as a local memory. Memory tiles contain 4 kilobytes of SRAM each and specialized memory controllers to support data streaming, which will be gone into more detail later. The tiles are arranged such that all tiles in the same column are of the same type, and every fourth column is a memory tile column, yielding a 3 to 1 PE to memory tile ratio. In total, there are 384 PEs and 128 memory tiles. The global buffer streams both application and configuration data to and from the CGRA and contains 4 megabytes of storage. The global buffer is organized into 16 tiles, each of which has a load and store unit supporting up to 16 input streams and 16 output streams. Lastly, the ARM Cortex M3 based processor subsystem manages application execution on the CGRA and off chip communication. Amber contains three main features that address the common shortcomings of reconfigurable accelerators mentioned before. First, Amber can be dynamically reconfigured to run new applications, and it can run several independent kernels in parallel to prevent valuable resources from sitting idle. Second, it has specialized, efficient streaming memories that support any affine access pattern, which are very common in the dense linear algebra applications we're targeting. And finally, Amber's compute units can be chained together to support infrequently used but necessary complex arithmetic with very small area overhead. First, I'll talk about Amber's dynamic partial reconfiguration capabilities. Reconfigurable accelerators need to switch between different applications and kernels all the time. For example, Edge devices have to run several different kernels but have limited resources, so they need to tie multiplex kernels on the resources that they have. In the cloud, several different users are trying to run different applications on the same hardware. In both of these scenarios, reconfiguration between different applications must be fast to maximize hardware utilization. In a more concrete example, let's say we're processing a stream of raw images from a camera sensor and we have to run one kernel, camera pipeline, on every frame, and a second kernel, ResNet, only on keyframes in the image stream. If we do not have the ability to quickly repurpose CGRA resources while other kernels are running, the portion of the CGRA configured for the keyframe kernel would be sitting idle during any frame that's not a keyframe, as shown in the figure here. Amber addresses this problem with dynamic partial reconfiguration, or DPR. Dynamic partial reconfiguration allows us to rapidly reconfigure regions of the CGRA while other kernels are running and ensures that most CGRA resources are always doing useful work rather than sitting idle. With this system, we can run up to eight distinct kernels simultaneously. Now, going back to the example from before with Amber's dynamic partial reconfiguration, we can use all of the CGRA to run the camera pipeline kernel increasing throughput during non-keyframe processing. On keyframes, we can quickly switch part of the array to run ResNet. When keyframe processing is complete, we can quickly switch the portion of the CGRA back to running camera pipeline, preventing resources from sitting idle. There are two main features of the architecture that allow us to achieve rapid reconfiguration. First, we leverage the parallel global buffer tiles to stream configuration onto the CGRA. There are 16 tiles, so we have 16 parallel configuration streams, or one for every two CGRA columns. Second, the pipeline configuration network within the global buffer and the CGRA allow us to configure at high clock frequencies. We're able to do this with minimal area overhead because we're simply repurposing the storage and streaming controllers within the global buffer, which are already present to handle streaming of application data to and from the CGRA. Amber's configuration system is able to fully configure the CGRA in three and a half microseconds. Compared to the Axi Lite CGRA configuration baseline, 
This uses 687 times less configuration energy and is 662 times faster. And compared to an FPGA configuration system that we benchmarked, our configuration network has over 36 times more configuration throughput. To demonstrate the application performance benefits of DPR, we ran the example introduced before with camera pipeline and ResNet on Amber with and without using DPR. Without DPR, region 2 of the CGRA is sitting idle during non-key frames. Because DPR allows us to use region 2 for camera pipeline during non-key frames rather than leaving it idle, the CGRA with DPR completes the task almost twice as fast as the CGRA without it, while also using 29% less energy. Next, I'll talk about the streaming memories in Amber. Often, accelerators use direct memory access engines, or DMAs, to access on-chip memory. But these have high area and energy costs because of their generality. We observe that the dense linear algebra applications that Amber targets access memory in an affine pattern. As such, we can specialize the memory controllers in all levels of Amber's memories, the global buffer, the memory tiles, and the PE register file, to support affine access patterns and stream data throughout Amber. The memory controllers have three main parts that have to be configured, each of which corresponds to a part of the affine pattern shown here. First, the iteration domain specifies the range of the memory operations. It is a set of counters corresponding to the index in each of the nested for loops. Second, the address generator converts the counter values from the iteration domain into actual memory addresses. Essentially, it implements the body of the for loop. Lastly, the schedule generator is very similar to the address generator, except instead of computing addresses, it generates read and write enable signals for the memories using the iteration domain counter values. Because the configuration parameters for the iteration domain, address generator, and schedule generator correspond directly to the memory access pattern in the application code. They are automatically extracted from the application by the application compiler. And application writers don't have to worry about the low-level details of configuring these memories. Additionally, the memory tile has further optimizations to improve the efficiency of the baseline streaming memory controller. First, the memory tile uses 64-bit wide-fetch SRAMs. The CGRA word length is 16 bits, so each SRAM word is four CGRA words. Using wide-fetch SRAMs cuts the access energy per byte in half compared to using a single-width SRAM, and allows us to create a memory tile with two input and two output ports by aggregating inputs from the CGRA with the serial in, parallel out buffers, and separating SRAM words into CGRA words with the parallel in, serial out buffers. Second, we take advantage of opportunities to share counters across each of the four controllers in our two input and two output memories. Reads from serial in parallel out buffers are always followed by writes to SRAM. Because these operations are related to each other, they can share iteration domain counters. Similarly, reads from SRAM are followed by writes to parallel in serial out buffers, so those iteration domain counters can also be shared. Another way to think of this is that when two different controllers share the same iteration domain, they are acting as two lines of code calculating two separate addresses in the body of the same for loop. Lastly, we eliminate the use of multipliers when calculating affine patterns. If we naively implement the circuitry to calculate the affine pattern shown here, we would use two multipliers. Multipliers are expensive, both area and power-wise. Instead, since we know what the loop variables are and how they'll be incremented, we can eliminate the multipliers by using a recurrence relation. On each iteration of the loop, the address is incremented or decremented by the proper amount when the inner loop reaches the boundary condition. To demonstrate the benefits of our specialized memory controllers, we've compared our implementation against the baseline where the PEs are used to directly generate SRAM addresses for a single fetch SRAM. 
The specialized streaming memory controllers yield an area savings of over 32% and an energy savings of 25%. Additionally, using a wide fetch SRAM yields an additional 26% area savings and a 30% energy savings. Next, I will talk about how Amber supports complex arithmetic with low overhead. Image processing and computer vision applications require, but infrequently use, complex arithmetic operations such as floating point division, natural log, sine, and exponential, which are expensive to implement in hardware. For example, in the non-local means application, which uses more complex operations than any other application in our benchmark suite, 15% of operations are complex. There are a few ways to support these infrequently used but necessary operations. One option is to offload them to the CPU, but that is very slow compared to using the CGRA. Another option is adding dedicated hardware to implement these operations in each PE. However, that is expensive and most applications don't need these operations. Instead, Amber does something in between these two approaches to support complex arithmetic in a reasonably performant manner without being too expensive. Instead of performing an entire complex operation within one PE, the PE contains supplementary operations that are essentially various manipulations of the floating point representation. With these supplementary operations, we can chain multiple PEs together to implement the complex operations we need. Here's an example of how we can chain three PEs and one memory tile together to perform floating point division. The basic approach is to use two PEs with our supplementary operations and a memory tile as a lookup table to calculate the reciprocal of our divisor B, and then use a third PE to multiply A by B's reciprocal. The Amber PE saves 37.8% in area, compared to a PE that has dedicated hardware for complex operations. The supplementary operations add a negligible amount of area, just 0.2% to each PE. For applications that don't use complex operations, Amber uses significantly less area. For NL means, which has complex arithmetic, Amber is less area efficient than having dedicated hardware since it requires using more CGRA tiles. But without native CGRA support and using the CPU to perform the complex operations, NL means would take 29.7 times longer. Overall, Amber still supports applications that need these operations without sacrificing performance, but saves a significant amount of area for the vast majority of applications that do not require them. Next, I'll talk about how we designed Amber. To design Amber, we built an agile accelerator compiler design flow in which design of the hardware is coupled with a compiler that runs applications on the custom hardware. Hardware design is based on using domain-specific languages, or DSLs, to generate the RTL and other collateral. Each hardware block has its own DSL. For PEs, we use Peak. Lake is used to design the memory tile. And for the interconnect, we use Canal. The generated RTL is connected together to create the CGRA RTL, which is then integrated into the SSC to create the final Amber chip. To run applications on Amber, we have an application compiler that uses the collateral generated by each of the DSLs to map applications onto the hardware. Going over the application flow more in detail, the compiler maps Halide applications, a DSL in C, C++, onto the CGRA. First, the Halide application is fed into a scheduler, which converts the application into a graph of generic hardware primitives. Next, the graph of generic hardware primitives is fed into the mapper, which converts the generic primitives into the actual resources present on the CGRA. The mapped application graph is fed to the place and route tool which places each node in the graph on a specific CGRA tile and connects them together using the reconfigurable interconnect. The result is fed into an automatic pipelining tool, which analyzes the place and route result 
and activate your registers in the interconnect on long paths in order to increase the maximum clock frequency of the application. Finally, the bitstream generator produces the bitstream to configure the CGRA. AMBER was implemented in TSMC 16 nanometer technology. The dye photo is on the left with the major blocks identified. Compared to the best recently published reconfigurable accelerator in the same technology node, our work has 1.7 times higher energy efficiency and 36.7 times better throughput. To evaluate application performance and efficiency in AMBER, we took a set of representative benchmark image processing, computer vision, and machine learning applications written in Halide and compared them against a set of CPUs, an NVIDIA Tesla K40 GPU, and a Xilinx Vertex Ultrascale FPGA. Here we have the energy delay product comparison between Amber and all of these platforms. For ResNet, we have compared a few of the representative layers against only the FPGA. As demonstrated on the graph, Amber significantly outperforms all of these platforms on an EDP basis for this set of applications. In conclusion, AMBER is a reconfigurable accelerator targeted for image processing, computer vision, and machine learning. AMBER addresses several common shortcomings of reconfigurable architectures. First, AMBER can be reconfigured rapidly and run several kernels in parallel, which prevents valuable resources from going idle. Second, AMBER's memory controllers efficiently implement affine access patterns which are common in dense linear algebra applications. Finally, AMBER's distributed implementation of complex arithmetic supports these uncommonly used operations for applications that need them without compromising efficiency on applications that don't. We also built an agile accelerator compiler design flow to both design AMBER and map applications written in Halide onto the CGRA. AMBER demonstrates significant EDP benefits when compared against CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs, showing efficient application domain acceleration. This work was made possible through funding from DARPA DSSOC, the AHA Agile Hardware Center, and the Stanford System X Alliance. Thank you. Well, Kathleen, that was excellent. Um, the, uh fascinating piece of work and uh, lots of fascinating results. Um, what is, do you have any thoughts about the balance of memory and compute uh, tiles in, in the architecture? Do you think you would you benefit from more memory or more, me more, more, more compute in terms of the architecture since uh, what you have is, is relatively fixed? Yes, yeah, so that is a great question. Um, so it really depends on what kind of application you are running on the CGRA. So for some applications uh, that we benchmarked and we've shown here, we discovered that we run out of compute tiles before we run out of memory space. Uh, so those are, um, for example, like the uh, like camera pipeline application. Uh, for other applications that we benchmarked, uh, such as the neural network uh, layers, we found that uh, we ran out of memory more quickly than we ran out of the compute tiles. Uh, so that is actually something we have been researching in terms of how do we balance the amount of compute and memory we have on the CGRA as we design the next generation of um, our uh, CGRA. Is it relatively easy or difficult to imagine uh, three of these implementations, you know, one with half the memory, one with what you have, and one with twice the memory in terms of the balance? <clears throat> Yeah, so in, actually in terms of like carrying out this exploration, um, it all it takes is, you know, what kind of uh, applications we are targeting um, and then running on various uh, versions of our CGRA. So with our agile uh, design flow um, that I covered in the presentation, we can actually quickly explore the design space of uh, both like the number of tiles um, in our CGRA, the ratio um, of the tiles, how the tiles are laid out, um, and also in terms of the individual architectures of, for example, the processing element as well. So with our kind of uh, hardware, agile hardware design flow, we're able to do this exploration pretty quickly. And uh, one of the questions is, how does this compare to uh, the GraphCore IPUs? Yeah, so um, 
The Graph Core IPU, I think, is targeted mostly for machine learning. Uh, with our CJRA, we are targeting more of a broader application space of dense linear algebra applications. Um, and then also looking at the Graph Core IPU architecture, um, it seems like their tiles run asynchronously. Uh, with Amber, all of our tiles um, run together. Um, so they're all synchronized together in terms of when execution starts and when execution ends. Um, and then Amber is, um, of course, uh, a little bit smaller than the Graph Core IPU as well. <laughs> and um, how does your, um, your uh, division compare with uh, your ads? Uh, in terms of like area performance, yeah, so both. yeah, yeah. So definitely in terms of area, our floating point division, as you saw in the presentation, takes four tiles versus our both our floating point ad and our integer ad. We implement that completely within one PE tile. Uh, so in terms of um, uh, area wise, definitely the floating point division takes a lot more. Uh, I guess, CGRA resources, um, but we see that as a uh, fair trade-off in terms of the fact that we don't actually use floating point division as much as we use uh, add or even a floating point add in the applications we are targeting. Um, in terms of performance, um, I would say it's about, uh, you know, maybe a little bit performance overhead, if not the same performance, um, if we were to implement uh, division within one PE, um, mostly because all of our applications that we run on the CGRA are pipeline, so we're still able to hit uh, a pretty high frequency, um, uh, regardless of how many uh, PEs we use to run uh, the division operation. Uh, so in one of your um, examples, you talked about running two applications uh, alongside each other uh, so mm -hmm. that you uh, got a lot less uh, idle time. Uh, do those have to be compiled together in order to get that effect? Uh, so in order to run two applications on Amber, we have to design the or write the applications in Halide separately, um, but they are not necessarily compiled together in one program. They're actually two, so we generate two separate bit streams. And then, so we, we compile the bit stream, generate that bit stream. And then when we want to reconfigure part of the array, then we load that bit stream onto that portion of the CG array. Um, all right. So do the, all the kernels need to be orthogonal or independent? Uh, do they share any memory space? Uh, currently the applications that we run, uh, do not share any memory space. So for example, the memory tiles, um, are either allocated to one application or to another. They're not shared across, uh, if we're, for example, we're running multiple applications on the CGRA. Well, um, that that was great. Those were uh, terrific answers. There's there's some more questions. One of them um, asked about uh, doing comparisons to some more recent um, um, systems rather than to the what one author uh, one questioner thought were old systems. So you mm -hmm. might you might think about that in terms of uh, answers online. Um, that I know you'll be around. Thank you very much. That Sounds was excellent. Good. Thank you so much. So our, uh, our last talk of the session is uh, ARM uh, Morello Evaluation Platform, Validating Cherry-Based um, Security in a High-Performance System. Uh, the author is uh, Richard uh, Grisenwaith um, and some co-authors. Uh, Richard has been at ARM for um, uh, uh, more than 20 years and has a Huge influence on the ARM architecture, beginning with ARM 6. Um, and he's working today on ARM uh, version 9. Um, and the talk is about um, hardware security in a way that I think you'll find uh, quite interesting. Um, can we take it away, Richard? My name is Richard Grissenthwaite, and I'll be talking today about the Morello program, which is a really exciting prototyping platform that ARM has developed with the assistance of the UK Research and Innovation and its Digital Security by Design program to allow the evaluation of the concepts of Cherry capabilities in the context of the ARM architecture. Before I start, I need to acknowledge the contribution made by a large number of people at the University of Cambridge, SRI International and elsewhere, together with their backers, in the development of the Cherry architecture 
as this is the foundation of the Morello concept. ARM believes that security is the greatest challenge computing needs to address to meet its full potential. ARM technology is at the heart of the computing revolution, transforming every industry by giving ever-increased access to data and communications, and in extracting information and meaning from that data. To our way of thinking, there is plenty more that can be changed by the application of computing resources, but it is increasingly clear that people need to be able to trust this technology and the cost of cybercrime is extraordinarily high. In addition, in these uncertain times, computer security is very intertwined with national security. We don't say that security can be solved. It is very clear that, a, that there is an ongoing arms race between the computer architects and the hackers, whereby as the security of systems is improved in one area, so the attackers go on to find new and more sophisticated methods of attack. That said, it seems that memory safety issues such as buffer overflow and use after free form the basis of a lot of the reported vulnerabilities in a way that seems to be remarkably consistent, both between different computing ecosystems. The data on this slide comes from both Microsoft and from the open source Chromium project, and over time. The first internet worm, Morris Worm in 1988, depended on a buffer overflow exploit. And of course, the concept was first documented as far back as 1972. It would be nice to say that this was a problem that is going away, but it really isn't. And while languages such as Rust offer the prospect of being more inherently memory safe, the reality is that there is a lot of C and C++ code being written and adapted every day. And there are a lot of undetected vulnerabilities waiting to be exploited. For years, this has been seen as a software problem. But the interesting question is, what could we do in the hardware to address this? After all, if security is so important for the use of computing going forward, maybe the hardware needs to be better. This was the basic principle behind the generation of the Cherry architecture that the University of Cambridge has been working on for a little over the last decade. ARM started collaborating with them in 2014 to understand and develop this technology. The basic premise behind Cherry is to develop a new architectural concept within a RISC architecture called a capability, which is a fundamental data type inside the architecture alongside the general purpose registers which hold data. A capability designed primarily to hold an address and the limitations of its use, that is the permissible address range that it can access and a set of permissions such as read, write and execute that apply for accesses using that address. These are held together as a single 128-bit unit, and a further metadata tag is added to the register file and to the memory system to distinguish a capability from data. This metadata is very important, as it allows us to make capabilities unforgeable. You can't just build a capability out of data, and any attempt to manipulate a capability as if it were data causes the capability to lose its status and to become just data. In terms of what this does to the architecture, the main changes are that we have a full set of loads and stores that take their base address from the capability register and check the generated addresses, which might typically have an integer offset added to it, against the bounds of the capability. In addition, the permissions for the capability are checked alongside the normal memory management checks. Any violation of the capability-based checks give rise to a memory abort in very much the same way as you have memory management faults from the TLV. We still have ordinary loads and stores which take the address from traditional general purpose registers, but we add something called the default data capability to apply bounds and permissions to such accesses. This creates a sandbox for legacy code. New data processing instructions are added to operate on capabilities. While the majority of data processing operations are performed on data, it is necessary on occasions to perform various arithmetic and logical operations on an address that is held in a capability so that it can be used for a later load or store. These new data processing instructions have certain rules. The addresses can be adjusted within limits defined by the bounds of the capability. You cannot just take it arbitrarily out of range. Very importantly, it is generally not possible to increase the bounds that are held within a capability. 
The instructions allow you to decrease the bounds or permissions for a capability to allow the creation of sub-objects from an original object, but you cannot increase the bounds or permissions without a capability that gives you that right. This gives a monotonicity of permission that is the essence of the compartmentalization we can build from this technology and is fundamentally enforced by the data processing instructions that are able to work on capabilities. Attempting to manipulate a capability outside of these limits results in it being transformed into just ordinary data. On the instruction side, we want capability to define regions of code, for example, a library of functions. The program counter becomes the program counter capability, so has a set of bounds associated with it. Direct branches can branch within the bounds. Indirect branches can change the capability bounds, so giving the ability to call between different blocks of computation. Once we have this functionality, then we re replace some or all of the addresses that are usually held in general purpose registers with capabilities, and we have a foundation for improved security. So how do we use these primitives? That is the big question on the whole basis of the Morello program. Crudely, there are two ways that these can be used, and they are not mutually exclusive. The first is to replace pretty much every address in the code with a capability by recompiling, though some minor source code changes may be required. This recompilation can add the bounds to a great number of heap objects, so inherently giving strong spatial memory safety properties. It can also be used as the basis of a temporal memory safety approach, as the metadata that distinguishes capabilities from data allows a quarantine and garbage collection-like approach when freeing up memory in the C language. The main cost of using the Cherry technology in this way comes from the larger cache and the memory footprint of the 128-bit capabilities, which various benchmarks have shown to be in the range of around 0 to 5%. Though in some point to heavy workloads, it can be more than that. Capabilities also offer the ability to construct much more fine-grained compartmentalization than can be achieved today, where compartments are typically constructed using multiple processes within an application. With more fine-grained compartmentalization, software can be built to be more robust by limiting the damage that can be done by a single exploited vulnerability and so increasing the overall security of the system. We know that from earlier prototyping that Cherry can reduce the overhead of switching between compartments by orders of magnitude compared with a traditional process switch. Using fine-grained compartmentalization to increase security will take more work for software developers, as programmers are not used to having the ability to create fine-grained compartments. It is usually too expensive. So the question is, if you have this capability, what would you do with it? We produced this Morello demonstrator system to help answer that question. Our confidence in the potential of this technology is based in part on a detailed study by Microsoft Security Research Center of all of Microsoft's 2019 memory safety vulnerabilities that required a software update. The summary is that they found that Cherry, when combined with other mitigations, would have deterministically mitigated at least two-thirds of those issues. Details of this are published in a 42-page report. And that is before we take into consideration the benefits that can come from the ability to use fine-grained compartmentalization. In order to enable software prototyping of the use of Cherry technology, ARM has developed the Morello prototype system. This was done in close collaboration with its partners, the Universities of Cambridge and Edinburgh and Lanaro, and with funding support of UK Research and Innovation under the Digital Security by Design program. This has generated a prototype version of the ARM v8.2 architecture, capable of running standard ARM software, and now with a full set of capability extensions. Indeed, for this prototype, we added a number of features to the capability architecture whose value was more debatable in order to test those as part of this evaluation. This prototype architecture was built into a new experimental high-performance out-of-order CPU based on the Neoverse N1 processors that are shipping today. And we put four of these CPUs, together with a Mali G76 GPU, into an SOC that is compliant with the base system architecture, suitable for either server or client workloads. 
This SOC is then built into a demonstrator board. We've created a port of the Linux operating system to support the use of capabilities and an LLVM-based toolchain to create capability code. All of the other standard documentation support deliverables have also been produced to allow people to experiment with these systems, which we are making available to a variety of partners, including Google, Microsoft, and a number of universities and smaller companies under the guidance of UKRI and the UK Digital Catapult. The UK Digital Security by Design program also provided funding for universities and smaller companies to experiment with the Morello systems, while larger companies have committed to do their own Morello research. Only a relatively small number of the Morello boards have been built, as this is a pure prototyping system, not a commercial product. This is a basic die plot of Morello on a TSMC N7 process, where the CPUs run at 2.5 GHz. For this presentation, I want to look at what we had to do to the processor design in order to give, give an idea of the impact of capabilities across the microarchitecture on the Morello CPUs. The first and most obvious change is that we need to support a register file with a set of capabilities as an alternative to the normal 64-bit general purpose registers. The capability registers actually overlap with the general purpose registers rather than forming a separate register file. Practically, a general purpose register file contains a mix of address and data, and it was more efficient to keep the number of architecture register names down by overlapping the register files. For the sake of experimentation, we made all 32 architectural registers able to hold either data or capabilities, though a commercial implementation might choose to have fewer capability registers. Of course, the design actually has far more physical registers than architectural ones, and we expanded the width of all of those to 129 bits, including the metadata tag, as part of the prototype. Similarly, the metadata tag needs to be added to each of the caches, and the system buses are expanded to carry the tag information. Essentially, quite a lot of the microarchitecture has expanded to have a 129-bit capability as a first-class concept. And that has quite a lot of impact on the overall data path design. In Morello, we chose not to simply double the width of all of the data paths to memory, partly to ensure that performance and area comparisons would be realistic. But in a production system, this would need to be looked at with more performance modeling. One of the more experimental capability features that we built into the Morello architecture is that the default data capability can apply an offset to general purpose register-based address calculations. The rationale for this was to allow the compartmentalization of several uses of the same legacy code in a sandboxing way. This hits the implementation's address generation stage by turning a two-way addition into a three-way one, which is understandably controversial for most microarchitectures. We put the feature into Morello to help us assess how valuable this usage model is. In my view, given the impact on implementations, we need quite a lot of evidence of the value of that feature, and including it in the Morello prototype is a good way of assessing that value. The main change to the load store unit is that loads and stores need to check that the memory accesses are in range and have the right permissions. Most of those checks are address-based checks that run in parallel with the normal memory management function of the TLB and have similar timing. But Morello introduces a new type of permission check to check whether a capability is allowed to be stored to a memory location. This is important for temporal memory safety. This introduces a new dependency on data on the fault checking path. The fact that addresses are now held as 129-bit values mean that the atomic instructions that are typically used on a pair of addresses have to expand to give 258-bit atomicity. One of the clever things about the Cherry architecture is that the base, bounds, and permissions information of a capability is captured in as few as 64 bits of additional state. And this means that when the address checks are performed, the base and bounds need to be uncompressed to allow the bounds to be compared with the address calculation result. A lot of work has gone into studying the compression to come up with a scheme that can be quickly decompressed when necessary so as not to impact any critical paths of the device. In the memory access path, the decompression of the base and bounds is done as a pair of expansions in parallel with the address generation arithmetic. 
And that means that the bounds check is timed in a very similar way to a normal TLB hit case. The details of the expansion are shown in this slide, involving a reasonable amount of logic, two shifters, an adder, and three comparators for each of the base and the limit. We found that fitted into a full cycle in the Morello CPU without impacting the overall critical timing path of the design. One of the consequences of the way that the address bounds are compressed into fewer than 64 bits is that not all values of an address are representable for a given set of base and bounds, which means that if an address part of a capability is taken too far out of range as part of an arithmetic operation, we can't represent that in the compression scheme. Fortunately, doing that in C is illegal, and the compiler can arrange that any intermediate uh, calculations stay in range. So when we do any arithmetic on the capability, there is also a representability check that the address has not been pushed too far out of range. The design of the capability encoding ensures that we can do this check with compressed capabilities, so not hitting the critical path of the arithmetic. There are a small number of integer operations on capabilities that do need to have the capability decompressed, but these occur sufficiently infrequently that they can take multiple cycles. Since the PC becomes a capability as part of the Morello architecture, this introduces a number of questions about how to handle the indirect prediction of PC capabilities. The highest performance solution is to expand the indirect branch prediction targets to hold 129-bit capabilities, so allowing change in the base and bounds of the PC to be predicted, though this comes at a non-trivial area cost. Two other options exist. One is to use the fact that most indirect branches don't end up changing the PC base and bounds to predict that the bounds won't change as part of an indirect branch. The other is to simply stall until the new bounds are known. The stalling option doesn't appear to be a good one for a number of code sequences. The Morello prototype system implements two ways of holding the metadata tags in memory to allow us to do performance measurements to compare between these different approaches. The first approach is to carve out a less than 1% area of the DRAM to hold the tags and to split all cache misses into, into two memory accesses, one that is looking up the data and one that is looking up the metadata. In the Morello system, we augment this with a caching structure to minimize the number of metadata accesses to memory. And this allows us to evaluate such caching performance. The second approach is to have the metadata explicitly held alongside the memory by repurposing the bits that are usually used for ECC data. For an experimental platform like Morello, we can do this as the prototype system can manage without ECC protection. Hardware is only part of the program, and there is a full demonstration open source software stack running Cherry BSD, which is an adapted version of FreeBSD to use capabilities to give a memory safe kernel and user space and which can run all of the legacy ARM applications. This is a perfect demonstration vehicle for the capability technology. The X11 KDE-based desktop environment was ported in three months by a single engineer having to make changes to less than 0.03% of the six million lines of code. These changes give an assessed vulnerability mitigation rate of some 73.8%. This screenshot came from a presentation using the Morello platform that Robert Watson of the Cambridge Computer Labs made in May this year. Another major strand of work we did was to use formal methods to prove the security properties of the Morello architecture, as the whole concept is based on having the monotonicity of reachable capabilities. That is what allows the technology to form the basis of lightweight compartmentalization. Teams at the Universities of Cambridge and Edinburgh took the description of the Morello architecture, which runs to some 62,000 lines of code, and proved security properties formally using the Isabel Proof Assistant. In doing this, three security issues were found before TAPAT. So now we have the Morello platform as an amazing vehicle to allow software developers to experiment with the concepts of Cherry for software that is commonly used in the ARM architecture. This should be a really great opportunity to understand this new technology and to help us refine the details of the architecture that we would make of it commercially available in future products. It also gives a real vehicle to allow red teams to attack the technology 
and to allow a wider range of software users to try using this technology. For example, the existence of Morello has created a lot of excitement in the Rust community, and there are academics looking at its use for Java and for JavaScript. The Cherry technologies are not patented. We would actually like other architectures to be able to build these, as it will encourage adoption by the wider software community. So Morello also acts as a showcase of the technology for other architectures, as well as for ARM. Overall, we are very excited by the prospects of this technology, and we want to see how Morello can be used to properly explore this very promising approach to the vital area of security. Thank you. Uh, Richard, thank you very much. I love this talk. Uh, it reminds me of my early days where my first computer was actually had, had tags and capabilities. Uh, it's kind of amazing uh, thinking back. Of course, everyone wants to know um, what does this look like in terms of uh, area and power compared to exactly the same machine and the same technology where you strip out all of that stuff? which you presumably could do. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we didn't, when we did the, um, the design of this, uh, fully optimize it because the purpose of this is really to act as a software demonstrator rather than to explore exactly what can be done from a hardware point of view. So we, um, you could be very careful about any direct comparisons. This wasn't a, um, an attempt to give the, uh, you know, what is the, smallest possible um, cost of this or what is the highest performance one. And we certainly, from the point of view of under, um, understanding what the technology would be uh, useful for, um, things like understanding the power consequences weren't a first order consideration. It's actually more important to, to get something in the hands of software developers. But the, we, you know, we believe the area cost is substantially less than 10% within the CPU, and that's just for the CPU. By the time you take the rest of the system, including things like system caches, it actually comes down to be substantially less than that. So 10% uh, or um, less, is that, the, is that your off the well, within Well, within the CPU itself, and actually smaller in the overall system. Right. And another question was, well, what about uh, I.O. and other systems that have access to memory that are not the CPU? Yeah, I mean, so this is, um, it's important to realize that unlike some of the capability systems that you, you're talking about in your, your past, um, uh, this is actually sitting on top of traditional virtual memory and is using all of the facilities of, of virtual memory. And so, uh, you know, where, where people have got uh, things like system MMUs protecting those um, other components, those... Um, so that still works in precisely the same way. If you need the sort of fine grain um, protections you get from capabilities, it would be possible to also, wherever you've got addresses in use inside a DMA or inside a GPU or anything like that, they could be expanded uh, to also have capabilities added. But that's, that's kind of uh, an additional way of using capabilities and isn't fundamental to the benefits that we see from it. So it can be contained within the CPU. But we see actually as a research topic, the, um, you know, if capabilities work well inside CPUs, then they can be used in other non-CPU components as well. So one question that I'm really uh, uh, interested in is uh, if you have an operating system that's manipulating these capabilities, can that particular operating system also be virtualized? Uh, yes, absolutely. As I say, all of this sits entirely on top of um, virtualization, uh, on top of virtual memory. And if you've got the traditional two stages of translation that exists, um, that is typically used to run a hypervisor there, then all of that can be um, uh, used in exactly the same way. Great. So, uh, and uh, the 10% the was an area estimate, is that correct? What about? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So the power, so, I think, would be substantially less than that. Power is similar? You would say? Uh, I think I think I think you'll find the power is is probably uh, less. Again, we didn't put uh, any significant effort to optimize the power in in this experiment. And you would say that the speed penalty is even less. Well, the, we you know we showed the the two point five gigahertz. If you actually look at the um, um, the critical parts of the design. 
effectively the capabilities aren't sitting um, on any of those critical paths. The only reason that we're actually at that um, 2.5 is we didn't do that sort of the last 10 to 15 percent of performance optimization that we would normally do for a production system simply because uh, we didn't have the time we wanted to get this out and um, for people to be able to do the software experimentation which is the primary purpose of the Morello platform rather than anything else but we've no reason to believe what that this needs to hit any of the critical parts of the design. And you mentioned the um, the uh, the problem of branch prediction and what you did about that uh, were there any other MMU-related issues that you had to deal with, especially? Oh, yeah, I think uh, one of the MMU ones that we talk about in the presentation is the fact that you do get faults from slightly different places. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, that is a... Uh, you, you can Got it. get faults generated as a result of, of the data that you're trying to store, and that's, that's kind of a new concept. Uh, and so from the point of view of fault checking, which is a big part of what MMUs have to do, right. then they, that was something new that people had to, had to go and um, uh, figure with, which was um, some of the learning and, and has been touched on. Well, uh, can I just come back on, on the clock frequency um, point? The, the one area that might be a clock frequency issue is this um, addition onto the direct data capability that I talked about in the presentation, and that is... Um, something that we have um that's part of the reason we put it in there was to experiment on the real value of that aspect of it um and it's part of the beauty of doing an experiment like morello and, and putting this into the hands of software developers is we can ask the question is that this particular feature or capabilities an important one for your software because if so we're going to have to think very hard about that um impact on the address generation part well, Richard, I love this talk. Um, I think it's a really important one, and I'm sure people will think hard about it and study your paper. Um, you promised to be around for another 24 hours on the Slack channel, and I think there are quite a few questions in there already that I didn't get to. So thank you very much for an excellent talk. Thank you very much. <clears throat>